This is the Three Gun Show, episode 63, with Kurt Heavy Drop Gruber. Welcome to the Three Gun Show. I am your host, Dave Hartman. In this episode, Kurt Gruber and I discuss how to go from slinging rounds downrange to a more focused and structured practice, and the Extreme Bolts Texas Three Gun Championship presented by Freddy Munitions. This episode is brought to you by MGM Targets. Setting industry standards in quality and innovation for over 20 years, MGM Targets has grown to be the most well known brand of steel targets worldwide. The code DHMGM10 will save you 10% on your purchase. MGM Targets, leave nothing to chance. Now, MGM is doing a target giveaway for one lucky listener of the Three Gun Show as well, so be sure to listen after the interview for details. Links to everything Kurt and I discuss can be found in the show notes at threegunshow.com slash episode 63. And now please join me in welcoming the show, Kurt Heavy Drop Gruber. Kurt, welcome to the Three Gun Show. Hey, Dave. It's good to be here. Well, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm glad that you came on the show, man. It's uh, it's exciting to uh, to speak with you after we met in Shot Show, and uh, looking forward to getting to know you a little bit better here. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. The the craziness of Shot Show. You run into people, and you're moving a thousand miles an hour. And uh, the first few weeks after Shot Show is always the fun one, where you get to kind of catch up with all the people you you had drive-bys with there and didn't really get to uh actually talk to and uh get to get much time with so yeah for sure and then uh i actually spotted you on like an its tactical like a uh, shot show rundown they had a picture of like just a you know they were trying to show like just an aisle of like how many uh booths were down it and right. sure enough you were standing right there i was like hey i know that guy yeah that's that's actually kind of funny story because um, uh, you weren't the first person to bring that up to me, and uh, so I, I of course had to go look. Everybody says, "Hey, man, check it out! You're on ITS Tactical." I'm like, "Oh, wow, check it!" So I go look, and it's the day four shot show rundown. Now, the funny thing about that is that I wasn't there on day four, um, <laughs> and the picture that they uh, had was on day one on Tuesday. Uh, I, I know that because it was the only day I tucked in my shirt. After this day one, <laughs> there was pretty much no energy left to t- even tuck in my shirt. That was the business day, and then everything yeah. else was casual, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, sweet. Well, uh, Kurt, I want to get into uh, you know shooting your uh, shooting pedigree. We, uh, I know you shoot for Team Adams Arms, and you run a sweet match in Texas that I've heard from a lot of people is uh, is like a have to make. But first, I want to get to know you just a little bit why don't you tell us uh who you are off the range all right well <clears throat> off the range i juggle a number of hats um the dad being the most important one um i've got a lovely wife and three lovely daughters you know the, the good lord chose to bless me with girls because i was bad when i was young <laughs> um and then to make it extra wonderful or painful, depending on how you look at it, I look at it as wonderful. He put them eight years apart. So my uh, wife and I came to the realization not long after the little one was born that we were going to have a teenage girl in the house for the next 18 years. <laughs> oh, um, my God. And then we then we looked, sat down and looked at where we live and said, okay, that's all right. There's at least four world-class vodka distilleries within 30 minutes of where we're sitting. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm guess you said the little one. So I'm guessing you have like an eight and a sixteen year old as well. Yeah. So I've al- <clears throat> almost two. Oh, okay. Uh, Emma, Emma will be two in April, which is amazing how time flies. Um, she's uh, hasn't got nearly as much range time as I hoped she would. Uh, one of the cool things about this community is the uh, the cool things that I got when Emma was born. You know. Uh, good friend in Dallas just from the shooting community made a really uh awesome uh sign that's hanging in her bedroom still um and then uh Mondo down at Animal Customs him and his wife made a Adams Arms Hayes Customs gun uh onesie 
in the Adams Arms team jersey layout for her when she was little. Oh, that's um, kind of cool. Which fit her until she was about 18 months and then but she she's grown pretty fast so she doesn't really fit her anymore but uh, and then I've got my middle middle daughter Hannah who's she'll be 10 about two weeks after Emma turns two and then my oldest will be 18 in October man that that's uh that's quite the spread right there yeah so when's uh when's the fourth coming then I guess another six years uh, you know um <laughs> I know what causes that, and I know how to fix it. <laughs> figured- so there will not be a fourth. <laughs> figured it out, huh? Yeah. So. <laughs> well, good times. Well, Kurt, uh, I I know you from, like, social media, basically, and then just, like, the brief interaction that we had uh, when uh, we were setting up over at the uh, X-Rail booth. Um <laughs> One of the things I wanted to ask you about is you've got, like, a pretty unique nickname. Yeah. And it's it's Heavy Drop, right? Right. Yep. Where, where did you get that nickname? <clears throat> so that kind of goes back quite a ways. I used to be pretty uh, – I used to play a lot of Airsoft. I used to be pretty heavy in the male sim Airsoft community. Okay. Um, and uh, I used to go to a lot of events, uh, travel to, to a lot of Airsoft events, and one of the uh, kind of – guest commanders that I used to, uh, quote unquote fight under, uh, was a, is a retired, uh, U S army ranger, uh, black hat named Max Mullen and, uh, master Sergeant Mullen, uh, gave me the nickname heavy drop once because I was always running around with the, you know, I would run a, uh, gas, uh, M249 saw and I was kind of the heavy gunner. And, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, Aerial operations. That heavy drop is when you kind of when you drop a tank or a uh, piece of artillery onto a battlefield uh, out of out of the back of a plane. So heavy drop became my uh, my name because when he needed a heavy gunner, he'd call in a heavy drop. <laughs> I like it. And uh, how long did you uh, did you shoot airsoft? Ah, uh, you know, I spent about three three or four years uh, pretty heavy in that, and then. Uh, met, that's when I met some, some guys that I started shooting USPSA with. So this was probably back in, oh, the late nineties, um, you know, 97, 98 around there, um, uh, until around 2001. What, uh, what made you go to that first match? You know, it was interesting. I, I bought a new pistol. Uh, I think it was a Kimber 45 single stack, and there was a, uh, you know, how the, a lot of the the gun manufacturers will stuff some uh, document, you know, some some cards in with the with a gun when you buy it. And one of the things yeah. I pulled out was a it said USPSA, and I you know I'd never heard of such a thing, but man, it looked cool and did a little research. And you know, the internet was a lot le- had a lot less information on it than now is than it does now, but still was able to find some information. Yeah. And that looked like fun, so found out there was a match locally from one of the guys I played airsoft with, and went out and uh, uh, you know I was out there with my uh, three-inch barrel Kimber forty-five with I think I had four or five, maybe five eight-round magazines for it, and uh, sweet. I'll never forget that first match. It was the first time I ever saw a Texas star, and you had to shoot it through a barrel, and I remember I got to that barrel with three magazines left. And when I stepped away from that barrel, there were four plates still on Texas star and three <laughs> magazines in the barrel. <laughs> so that's uh that's quite the, uh, the intro to the shooting sports there. Yeah. But I was hooked. And really? Okay. So well, it was... I was absolutely hooked at that point. Okay. Um, I've been, very, I'm, I'm a very competitive guy. So I was like, I, there's no way I can be this bad at something that I love doing this much. Did you play like high school sports or anything like that? Or? Yeah, I played football in high school. Okay, um, is that where the competitiveness came from? Yeah, yeah, I played football. I was a power lifter. Um, you know, I had you know played football at a pretty high level. I was all district football player. So, you know, we uh, I was always pretty competitive. Um, 
And then, you know, when I came to college, you know, me and my fraternity brothers would always get out and play tons of basketball and stuff. And it was all, you know, it would get pretty rough. It would get pretty down and dirty. So, um, so then what yeah. was the, what was the next step then after that first match? Did you continue to compete with that Kimber or did you? So I actually, you know, I was stupid back then because, you know, you didn't know, um, and I saw all these guys, you know, one of the cool things about the club match they started shooting was that there were actually some pretty big names shooting it every month. Um, Dave Dawson was one of the, our lo- the local shooters. Um, but I didn't, you know, get smart and jump straight into something good. I said, well, hey, it looks like I need more ammo capacity. Kimber, sp- Kimber sells a double stack uh, 45. Let me go ahead and buy a Kimber double stack 45 and... <laughs> Shot that for a while and uh, actually went to a major match in Houston called uh, Space City Challenge, which was a really fun match. It still still goes on today. It was a really fun match Um, and really got punched in the gut at that match because uh, I found out that that it was possible for white box ammo not to make major in a forty-five. No kidding. uh, Well, it was a four-inch barrel. Right. You know, it wasn't a five inch barrel, so huh. and then I also found that trying to shoot uh uh plate rack at thirty yards with a four inch barrel forty five um kind of sucks <laughs> and I literally came home from that match in Houston, and uh one of my friends was selling an old uh Benny Hill open gun, and I bought that from him. And then I went to Dave Dawson's shop and put an order in for a brand new custom Dawson Precision open gun because I was never going to get embarrassed like that again. <laughs> did and it won't work? Straight into the deep end, into the open, into shooting open at yeah, that point. Straight into open. So, how long did you shoot open then? Uh, I shot open. So that was probably 2002. Uh, I shot a lot of uspsa till about 2010 oh okay and so 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 you must have liked it and you stuck with open that whole time uh pretty much i mean i i I, over you know over time then i also bought a limited gun and would switch over to limited sometimes um you know i it was it it was cool i got to i used to ro a lot of matches because i spent a lot of money on guns and ammo and didn't have a lot of money for match fees um and travel costs. So I would RO matches so that I would, they would cover my hotel and I'd get to shoot the match for free. And, uh, I got to meet a lot of cool people doing that guys like Travis Tomasi and Max Michelle. And, you know, talking to a lot of those guys, I found that going back and forth between the dot gun and a gun with iron sights. Every time I shot iron sights for a while, I'd, and I'd go back to the dot gun. I'd be faster with the dot. So, huh. And so why is that? I, you know, it's, you have to aim a lot more with iron sights. Right. Uh, you have to actually, there's a lot more work in shooting a limited gun and shooting an iron sight gun than shooting a dot gun. You know, you have to actually, with a limited gun, you actually have to line up your sights and see a good sight picture, whereas a dot, you put the dot to where you see the dot on the target, you pull the, tar- pull the trigger and, 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 and re- repeat. Um, so you can shoot a lot faster with a dot, especially a, you know, a, a good really good uspsa open gun um you know because it was shooting it was a 38 super um with loads that were very t- well tuned for that gun and that thing was just flat shooting you know i just could just rip through targets uh with it um with a major power factor 40 caliber limited gun that thing has a little bit more pop to it um so it took a lot more to just get on target and stay on target. Right. So there's, there's more, I guess kind of sounds like more patience involved, like waiting for the sites and absolutely. waiting for it to waiting get on target. For the sites to settle. Um, absolutely. Gotcha. So then, uh, when did it, um, when did it turn into three gun for you? Well, so all during that time, three gun was kind of a side, was kind of a side show. Um, kind of like we do today in three gun where when we have a month months with an extra weekend we'll have like a shotgun match well back then at our uspsa club on months where there was an extra 
weekend, we'd have a three-gun match. Um, and it was more old-school three-gun. There was no multi-gun back then, um, or that we knew of. Uh, there was, It was going on, but we were more knew more about the old like Soldier of Fortune-style three-gun where you have uh, you go to the show up at the match and there's six stages. There's two pistol stages, two rifle stages, and two shotgun stages. And you kind of pull huh, whatever you happen to have it in the safe out and you go out and play for the weekend, play for a day. Yeah, that's kind of the way uh, the match is at like my my local range, my closest range to me. It's uh, a lot of guys will bring out you know like Steyr Augs and right you know things that you oh, normally yeah, wouldn't was, see. You know, I was. Back then, I was shooting a you know a Bushmaster with a one of those like fifty millimeter uh, red dots mounted on the carry handle and Sweet. Uh, a uh, started shooting with a uh, Winchester thirteen hundred model thirteen hundred Defender pump and found out real fast that uh, even back then in the three gun we shot back then not having chokes uh, was a bad idea. Um, having just a cylinder choke was a bad idea because you get to a Texas star at twenty at fifteen, eighteen, twenty yards, you get a cylinder choke, you weren't doing anything. So I actually bought uh, my first three gun match, I bought a gun in between stages, a shotgun in between stages. Uh, <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, I shot the first stage with my pump and this guy uh, one of the guys there was selling a uh Virgil trip custom Remington eleven eighty seven. Um I was like, yep. After I shot my first stage, I was like, yep, that's not going to work. So I went over and talked to Paul and bought 1187 and shot the second stage with a new 1187. Was it a uh, little better? Oh, yeah. It was a lot better. <laughs> I didn't have a clue how to load it. Didn't have a clue, you know, really what I was doing running it. I'd never shot a semi-auto shotgun before that. But uh, uh, I, it had choke tubes. I could put a tighter. I uh, grew up hunting, so I, I understood what you needed to, you know, I grew up hunting and just, Scooting, uh, shooting skeet, so I understood what you needed to do with choke tubes. I just, you know, so it was definitely a whole different game between from one stage to the next. Oh, I bet. Um, well, and that seems like a like of a massive advantage too, because most people don't learn about chokes until they've been playing the game for a while. Right. Yeah, I grew up. So I grew up in North Dakota. I grew up, uh, you know, in a pretty strong sportsman family. Um, you know, hunting pheasant hunting doing some duck hunting although uh my dad and i both hate to eat ducks and hate to kill something we don't eat so we didn't do much duck hunting unless we went with somebody who we knew was good that, that they would take the ducks and eat them um it was mostly pheasant hunting pheasant partridge upland game pheasant partridge uh grouse um some turkey uh but yeah so uh i had the one gun probably that I had the most experience with at this point was a shotgun just from hunting. Gotcha. But, uh, but never in like a, uh, you know, shooting plates and no. flying clays type of environment. No. So did you pick it up pretty easy or was it like a hard transition? You know, once you figured out just to, you know, throw a, throw a rear sight on it and shoot it like the pistol, it was it became a lot more, it became a lot easier. Um, yeah, shotgun is probably my best gun now. Um, so, and so when about? Which is it, funny because that's the only, I, you know, you know, lots of people talk talk about guys that are sponsored shooters. It's it's funny because uh, a shotgun sponsor is the only sponsor I don't have, and it's probably my best gun. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, th- uh, this space for rent, I guess. Then. Uh, you know, <laughs> actually, I've got a local gun store here that's taking care of my shotgun needs. So. Oh, cool. So, so Kurt, then when did it turn from just like a side stage to like a regular thing for you? And did that have, did that have to do with like your local club changing or was it just something you sought out yourself? So 2010, I would say 2010 was an interesting year for me. So, um, uh, 2000, you know, we kind of saw it coming, uh, in 2009, shot some stuff, but we still didn't have the right gear. Um, to begin 2010, I spent the first two months in 2010 on the Horn of Africa uh, in Djibouti at Camp Lemonnier, uh working out there. And while I was there, I had lots of free time, and they were paying me pretty well. And so while I was there, I ordered a new rifle, and I ordered a new STI 9mm because 
the writing out was on the wall just from the little bit I've shot. I'd shot so far of three gun that nine millimeter was the way to go. Um, and then I came came back and shot the uh, 2010 Larue Tactical three gun uh, match out in. Uh, uh, it was in. Uh, Oh, where was it? It was in out by College Station. I can't remember the name of the Cawthon, Texas, Cawthon Cartridge Club. Oh, and okay. uh, man, it was it was pretty rough match. Uh, you know, the uh, there was a lot of things in it, but I at that point I pretty much knew I would probably never travel for another one gun match again. Um, you just enjoyed it that much? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the my mantra of why shoot one gun when you can shoot three took hold really fast. <laughs> it's a good mantra. A lot of um, guys, a lot of people I talk to live by that, you know? Uh, so then I, of course, so that match got over. I was, I got over on Sunday, got home Monday. I had a new gun safe delivered Tuesday. I got on a plane and had to do Iraq for two years. Um, so ah. that kind of put it up, put my shooting on hold a little bit, but I, it was, you know, I was hooked. So my first R and R uh, from Iraq, I was there over there as a, as a contractor, uh, IT contractor. Um, was after six months, after I'd been in country six months, was you know happened to line up with right around Thanksgiving. Well, most of the people, well, they'd come home for Christmas, but no, I came home for Thanksgiving, and every my my family was like, "Why are you here for Thanksgiving instead of Christmas?" I said, "Well, Fort Benning three guns next week, um, and I'm going." <laughs> So I, uh, I actually came home from Ar- to back to the U.S. from Iraq three times and scheduled all those three of those trips around three gun matches. Um, so hey, honey, good to see you going shooting. You know, luckily at that point, so <laughs> my my middle daughter and my oldest daughter and my stepdaughters. My I was single at that point still. Oh, my gotcha. Wife, my wife, I I met my wife after I can't got back from Iraq in 2012. So. Um, you know, it was just me, and then I had my, uh, you know, my parents and my sister and my dog. But other than that, you know, I didn't have anybody else to answer to, so, but myself. Um, that makes so it I was a able easier. to, you know, uh, I think one one of those R R and Rs. I wasn't actually officially in the U.S. because I wasn't really supposed to be here. Um, I uh, <laughs> flew from Iraq to Kuwait and then up to Germany and spent a few days hanging out with some friends that were uh, stationed at Ramstein, and then jumped on a plane, flew home, shot. That was for the LaRue Tactical 3-Gun in 2011. Uh, got home on Wednesday, shot Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Got on a plane on Monday and flew back to and spent five days in Rome. Um, and as far as anybody was concerned, I was in Germany and I was in Italy. Um, <laughs> I paid for the, you know... Luckily, I had lots of frequent flyer miles, so I covered the full of my flights from Germany back to the U.S. and the U.S. back to Italy on my own, and uh, uh, so you, you do know that this is like an internet broadcast show, right? Uh, it's all right. It's, it was just it was just <laughs> me and me and my employer that. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so. I gotcha. So bygones, right? Oh yeah. Well, so. Kurt, it sounds like you got like addicted to uh, to three gun pretty quick. And, Absolutely, uh, <laughs> those don't sound like the uh, actions of a man who's like casually interested in the sport. No, no. And then when I got home in 2012, I got lucky that you know I was working for a pretty great employer and uh, who recognized the fact that we'd spent the last you know two years working 72 hours a day. Uh, or 72 hours a week, uh, every week for basically the entire time we were over there. So I had some on the bench time when I got home and I used pretty much all that on the bench time for shooting. Um, I, I hit, I think it was 11 major matches that year. Um, traveled all over, shot as much as, shot as much as I could, you know, I'd spend, you know, three days at the range during the week and then jump in the car and head to a major match. Um, so that so was the. Were you? Uh, your, you did you ahead. keep to your only shooting three gun for major matches then? Yes. Okay. Yep. And so, yep. in in that time, then, 
you know, you're shooting all these matches, 11 major matches uh, a year. Did you do like any sort of a uh, practice to get your, your competency up or was it? Oh yeah. I mean, I was, I was training three days a week while I was, you know, when I wasn't, when I wasn't, uh, uh, traveling for a match, I was, I was shooting at the range. I was cool. burning what? through ammo. Very nice. What, what did, uh, what did that training look like? You know, back then that training was, uh, a lot of, uh, training harder, not necessarily training smarter. <laughs> okay. Um, so it was so just it, like, I'm so gonna I, would, more I would rounds take, range. you know, a thousand rounds to the range and shoot, you know, you know, 300 rounds of pistol, 500 rounds of, a rifle and a couple hundred rounds of shotgun and shoot all of it in not necessarily the best, the most efficient drills, but I was just getting a lot of rounds down range, getting, uh, getting used to my gear, um, uh, getting used to loading the shotgun, you know, back then we were weekend loading. So, uh, getting, learning to load your shotgun was a lot more, took a lot more work than it did now. Than yeah. It does now. Um, so, uh, so, so it was, then it was just banging rounds down range. It was banging tons of rounds down range. Yep. So when did you, you know, make the, uh, the transition or the realization to like, uh, I need a plan for, for my practice or my training. Once I had to go back to work and actually had to, uh, go back to having a real job and had my range time cut down, cut specific uh, distinctly. Um, and then once I got married and suddenly had at first two and then three or my first three, you know, well, first two, cause my wife, uh, was working also, but you know, had, had all kinds of mouths to feed other than my own. Um, so I couldn't, you know, before that it was feed me and feed my guns. Um, uh, so suddenly the, uh, ammo, training ammo budget got cut distinctly. So then did you like sit down and make a plan or did you seek, seek out help from, from that or what uh, did you do? little, a combination thereof. I sat down and made, made a plan. Then I worked, then I uh, reached out to a couple good friends who, um, who were instructors, who were trainers, um, and kind of worked with them on setting up, you know, coming up with what a good training regimen is I, I i'd be lying to you if i said i thought i have a really great training regimen still today um it's it's definitely still a work in progress um but you know it, it came down to you know these are the 10 rifle drills that i think i get the most out of these are the 10 pistol drills that i think i get the most out of and this is the shotgun this is what i do with my shotgun that i think get the most out of Um, the good thing about shotgun is I think I get, you get the best, the best shotgun practice. You never have to pull the trigger. Um, Right. It's all unloading, right? It's all unloading. And I can do that, you know, uh, spend 10, 15 minutes a day in the house, uh, on a break, or I've been known to be on a conference call that I didn't actually have to talk on. So I'd be on, I'll be on mute standing here loading my shotgun. (laughs) Uh Awesome. So... That was the nicest thing. The nice thing is, is even once I went back to work, I still worked from home. So, um, for the for the most part, well, that's good. Then you can take those uh, dry fire breaks. That works out. Yeah, absolutely. So, Kurt, what are uh, what are like some drills that you came up with? You know, of those ten most important that you still use now. Uh, so a lot of what I do now, um, actually, a lot of what I do now was when I. Last year, uh, MGM Targets ran a deal on auto poppers, and I bought some auto poppers and realized that that is yeah, those auto poppers are probably the absolute best training tool there is. Um, really, was that? Because they're little. Oh, okay. You got to aim. There's they do not. There's no room for hosing. There's no room for error. There is get on the gun. Get you know. Uh, get good aim and get break a good shot or else you're going to miss. Um, so I got spent a lot of time now. Uh, I'll go to the range and I'll set up um, a plate rack at the end of the range and an auto popper in each corner of the range and then set up a barricade at the, at each side of the, of the, 
uh, beginning of the range and my rifle practice will be running back and forth between the barricade practicing either getting on target offhand or getting onto the barricade and on target as fast as possible and breaking a good clean shot on those little bitty auto poppers. Um, that sounds good. Now, uh, what distance would those, uh, auto poppers be at 65, 70 up to 80 yards, depending on which bay I end up on at the range. Okay. And we're, we're talking like those, those small skinny guys, right? Yep. God, those ones are a pain. Oh, they are being, <laughs> They are, but they're, uh, like I said, when it comes to training tools, there aren't many things better than them. Yeah, I, I could see how that works. So that's your uh, your favorite drill for the rifle then? Yeah, and then, you know, uh, I still will set up targets along the, uh, along the outside of the bays and just see how fast I can get running and get, get rounds on each of those targets. Um, you know, just sh- for shooting on the move drills. Um, uh, and then the old Jerry Mitchell V drill for transition drills, um, is, uh, yeah, I, that's one of the, a drill that I think is hard to be beat. Um, I also spend a lot of time these days watching, you know, at work, at work, spend a lot of time, uh, watching like Keith, uh, Garcia's, uh, Facebook and seeing what new drills he comes up with. And, uh, cause he's, uh, he gets to spend a lot more time at it, and he's got a lot more experience coming up with drills, and he, he puts together some pretty darn good ones. Um, yeah, it seems like if you just kind of you know hang out and watch what he's doing and then go and repeat that on Saturday at the range or whenever you get to the right. range, it's pretty good pretty good training. Absolutely. Um, a couple of, especially some of his weapons, weapons manipulation drills. Um, it, it almost feels like these days that's something we... I, I feel like, like shotgun loading weapons manipulation is something that uh, a lot of the newer folks to the sports to the sport don't get enough work at um so i make sure that when they come to my match they have to do all of those things really well uh so well it, so that's a that's a good transition kurt now, now you run uh, a regular monthly match right we do and yep. then uh, you also run a, a, a bigger match that we're going to talk about in a minute here. But yep. What? So it's myself, uh, Aaron Hayes from Hayes Custom Guns, um, and then uh, another partner of ours named Brian uh, White. We put on those those matches, the, pretty much the three of us. Um, oh, of course, with a lot of help from the community because three guys. There's no way three guys can set up and tear down a match. Sure. But, and what range uh, is that? At Copperhead Creek. Oh, in okay. Marble Falls, Texas. I keep hearing great things about that range. You know, it's a pretty amazing facility. We're we're pretty lucky that we have such a great facility to host our matches at. Um, uh, we have a good combination of four really nice tack bays and then some really good uh, uh, open terrain stuff. Um, and then there's some, you know, we, we were continually working with them to... to for improvements on the range like one of the things we did last year for the major match that we held it was uh built a new uh 12 foot off the ground uh 10 foot by 20 foot deck shooting platform um yeah on, I, I saw, on the long range range i saw some video of that in uh in action how, how far can you get out at um off that platform uh so you can get out to we can get out to over six hundred yards, but of course we don't do that in three gun because people will complain. <laughs> um, not only will people complain, but honestly, it's uh, two twenty three at that distance. Uh, it's hard to reliably call hits, right? Um, but I loved getting up there with my six five Creed more and my bolt guns, and you know, running out six hundred six hundred fifty yards. Um, the targets go out as far as six hundred yards now, but there are a couple places where you can set targets a little bit further out there. Um, but it's nice. It's because it's nice because they keep it set up. So, you know, when I go out there to do to to, pr- to practice, if it's a long range practice day, I'm, I don't have to set any targets. Everything's already out there. Um, oh, that is nice. It saves so much time. Yeah, yeah, especially because it's an hour drive each way for from the house for me. Oh yeah. Um. So a normal, and, and it's great. It's a great range to to be affiliated with too, because I leave a lot of my steel there. Like I have a couple plate racks there and some other things. And when I'm headed out to train, I'll give them a call and say, "Hey, I'm coming out. Can you put my plate rack in a bay?" And I say, "Yeah, sure." When you get here, be hit bay six. Your your plate rack will be there. Um, <laughs> what, so. 
it's service doesn't get any better than that. That's awesome. Right. Because play racks are damn heavy. Yes, and they've got a tractor to move it with. So. Yeah. Hey, how cool is that? So then, Kurt, let's uh, let's talk about those monthly matches. What do those matches look like when uh, when you guys get out there? Uh, you know, we 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 kind of pride ourselves in putting on a little bit maybe more difficult than most monthly match. Um, it's it's not your it's your beginner can shoot it, but your beginner's gonna have to un- uh, the beginner's gonna have to understand that we that it's uh, one of the things we pride ourselves in. Especially, you know, Aaron and I travel a lot to shoot. Um, is trying to help guys, people, folks from Central Texas, be prepared to travel out into the into major matches and be competitive. Um, so we'll a lot of times we'll if we go to a match and we see a target array that we think is specifically particularly challenging and fun, you might see that in one of our monthly matches. Um, you also might see us testing stuff for our major match. Um, you know, because you have a lot of great ideas, but you don't know if it's going to work until you see somebody shoot it. Um, you also don't know what stipulations you need to write into the stage description until you see somebody game it. Right. So, so that's the, uh, that's the good thing about being able to run that, that monthly match then. Right. Absolutely. Uh, the other nice thing is, um, from a from a selfish pr- perspective, uh, if you run a monthly ma- monthly club match and you know you, so- you have something that you need extra work on, everybody gets extra work on it. <laughs> oh, for sure. So, so do you guys shoot those uh, year round? Uh, pretty much. Um, summer gets pretty warm. It's in the summer. It's pretty. It's the diehards. Um, you know, the, in August, the mat, it'll be 100, 500, 6 degrees out there on the range. Um, but you know, you got guys that are getting ready for, to go to Rocky mountain or to go to pro-am or, you know, uh, getting ready for the second, basically what I call the second half of the major match season. Uh, so we, a lot of the diehards will be out there every month. Um, you know, there's some months we, we don't get to have our match like in May this year, our, our normal match weekend is actually the three gun nation Southwest regional at the, at the, the the range that weekend so oh, we don't cool. get to have our club match but of course we're all going to shoot the three gun nation regional there that weekend so. yeah for sure so it's cool, cool that you get to have uh you know two major matches at your your home range basically yeah so it, it it's amazing how three gun in texas is, is is growing um this year i'll shoot five majors without leaving texas no kidding um Four major three gun. Well, I, I guess I I won't shoot four. I'll run one, shoot three major three gun matches, and one major shotgun match, and then one match that is major ish. Um, it has a prize table and stuff, but it's a really fun night match that uh, uh, zombie night match that we do every every uh, fall because um, there's just something cool about shooting with lights and lasers. That's uh. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, shooting lights with lights and lasers is kind of fun and kind of difficult if you've never done it before. Yeah. So, Kurt, the uh, the match that you run is the Extreme Bullets Texas Three Gun Championship. Uh, yep. pres- I guess the rest of that is presented by Freedom Munitions. Yes. So that match is coming up really quick here in uh, in the first weekend in April. What uh what do you guys have planned for that? Uh, so we've got some pretty pretty cool stuff planned. Um. You know, we put on a pretty solid match last year. Uh, I, I pride myself in running a match that, in, in designing a match that I'm really bummed I don't get to shoot for score. <clears throat> and I'm a I'm a shooter, so I, it's a lot of high round count stages. I think we're going to have one rifle stage this year that's 67 rounds. Nice. Um, you actually make people change magazines. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, we, do, we have a 40-something round... We always have a forty-something round shotgun stage. Um, this year, there is gonna, there's going to be a fair number of uh, flying clays in the match. Uh, one of our match sponsors is Promatic. So, um, I'm not familiar pretty... with Promatic. What do the What do they do? Promatic they do uh, they do uh, clay throwers like uh, a lot of uh, sporting clay 
ranges are built around Promatic throwers. Okay, like the big turret um, type things. Yeah, so the ones we're going to have are, are are they're pretty cool. Um, they're actually on wheels, so we can push them around. But they're they're an automated thrower that with on a computer programmer. So basically, like uh, one of the things we have lined up is that we're going to the shooter's going to yell pull just like they would at any you know skeet skeet range or uh, sporting clay range. The RO is going to hit the button and it's going to kick off. Uh, we're going to have two throwers there, and it's going to kick off a 15-second 10-bird flurry. So basically, you're going to get a bird every sec- every second and a half for 15 seconds. Sweet. Um, so That sounds like fun. Now, is that yeah. is that part of uh, like a larger stage? Yeah, it's part of about a 42-round shotgun stage. Oh, okay, so that'll be all shotgun. Yes. So yep. so how do you how do you then start the timer? Um is there like more shooting before that or more shooting yes. after that? Yeah, that's that's actually near the end of the stage. Oh, okay. Got it. Well, sweet. That's that sounds like fun. Well, yep. and, and so um I had Aaron Hayes on the the podcast and he was saying that one of the things that he wanted to do was uh shoot more shotgun this year. And yeah. it sounds like Texas is getting a lot of shotgun from what I'm hearing because you guys have like a uh or throwing another shotgun match on your on your monthly match schedule. Yep, we we uh, had our first one in January. Uh, April we will probably miss out because I don't think any of us are going to have any energy to run any more matches in April after the big match. Um, uh, and then we have a couple more couple more fifth Saturdays throughout the year that we'll have shotgun match. But we also have uh, coming up here in a couple weeks up in Crescent, Texas, uh, the North Texas multi-gun guys are having the Mossberg, uh, shotgun championship. So, a uh, two day long, all shotgun match. So that's cool. Are you going to that uh, one? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I, and I have to correct myself there. I'm going to get to shoot six major matches in Texas without leaving this year. I forgot the Starlight three gun is going to be a Copperhead, this Copperhead Greek this year too. Oh, no kidding. So, uh, well, sweet man, that it's it sounds like a lot of uh, a lot of three guns going on in Texas. Absolutely, was it? We have a, we have a great shooting community here. Um, yeah, for sure. We have a really strong, really strong shooting community. Um, so, plus a really big state. Yeah, <laughs> we have. I mean, so if you look at it, we have. If if you look at kind of club matches around here, we've got. We usually get. We'll get between 40, 40 and fifty people. Uh, at our club match, uh, the guys down at Dissident Arms in Houston, they'll they sell out their club match every every month with about sixty uh, shooters because they're the pretty much the only thing going around in the Houston area. Um, there's two or three I, from Austin. I can shoot. I could shoot. I can shoot three gun every weekend if I'm willing to drive to Houston and Dal- or Dallas, which is about three hours each way. Huh. So. Dang, that's, that's that's a lot of shooting. Yeah. So, Kurt, when uh, you know when you when you look at that match schedule that you have sit in front of you, and you have the uh, the the weekend matches as well, just like your your local club matches. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you use those as your practice for the major matches. So, when you're when you're looking at this schedule, how are you going to set up those those matches then for for the practice for the major matches. It's, so I've always kind of looked at a club match, even when I was shooting USPSA, I've always looked at, at a club match as an organized practice session. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things we did last year in August, cause August is, you know, it's so bloody hot in Texas is we set up a, uh, had kind of a skills challenge cause we knew we had a bunch of guys that were headed to, uh, Rocky mountain. So we threw in a ton of long range, a ton of offhand rifle stuff, um, so that they could make sure that they got the practice they needed to head to that match. Um, and then we also threw in some short range base stuff because I'm, you know, once again, I have to do stuff that I would need practice for too. And I was headed to pro am instead of instead of uh, instead of Rocky Mountain and pro am. You know, is a is a very short range. Uh, Bay type of hoser match, um, but really, I mean, we just kind of look at what's coming up on the schedule. Uh, Aaron and I are 
are lucky that we like said so we can we shoot we shoot quite a bit so we can go back to our videos from our matches and say hey this is something they did at uh fn last year this looks fun let's set this up um but it, it's really you know uh we also we've at our shotgun match in January, we set up some of the stages that Aaron had from the matchbook from the uh, uh, Ipsic World Shotgun match in uh, Italy last year. Oh, cool! So, how were how were uh, those stages? They were fun. We they were, so we did uh, seven stages that day, seven shotgun stages that day. We did uh, four short stage short courses. You know, the eight to eight to ten round. Uh, ipsic type short courses and right. then uh three long courses um the shortest the, the the smallest of which had 39 rounds <laughs> so those so. those uh short courses aren't something that we generally see in like i don't know i guess you call american practical shotgunning or anything no so how how was it setting that up what did you think of the stages and then what was the uh the reaction from the crowd I think I mean I think everybody enjoyed it. it. It's fun. It's something you know. Uh, you get it's something you get to, sh- you know, shooting's fun. And one of the things we did with you know that was one of the things we did to get more shooting in the match, but also to kind of change it up so that people could get some uh, exposure to the different kinds of shooting. Um, so you know we set up lots of no shoots. Set up uh, we did two empty gun starts on those short short courses uh set up where you didn't have you know set set up one where you didn't have a lot of room to to work to work with there was the you had your shooting box and there were barrels right in front of you and uh you know guys with their long magazine tubes you had to really work you really had to pay attention to make sure that you were manipulating your gun around the barrels um uh you know it's just good you know, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a great match, but it's also just good practice um, for when it counts. Yeah, for sure. It sounds like a sounds like a good time. I, I really enjoy you know all shotgun matches myself, and uh, it looks like there's there's a lot of interest in the uh, in the crowd as well. Yep. Yeah, we have quite a bit of interest in all shotgun matches around here. So yeah. So Kurt, then you uh you know you you mentioned that uh that you're shooting for Adam's arms. And I thought we'd, uh, we'd wrap up by, uh, talking about your gear real, real quick here. Okay. Now you didn't stay in, uh, in open then. Did you transition over to like tech ops type setup? You know, I shoot a lot of different, uh, I shoot a lot of different divisions. Um, the only division I don't pretty much don't shoot is limited. Um, because oh, okay. I, I just love scoped rifles. Um, you know, I, uh, shooting for us, op- uh, shooting for us optics. I get to, I get, I'm, I'm lucky that I get to have some of the best scopes you can buy on my rifles. Um, but I also just, I, I, I like a magnified optic. I don't really enjoy shooting a, uh, a, uh, red dot. So, but no, I shoot a lot of, I shoot some open three gun. I shoot mostly tack ops these days. Cause unfortunately I think one of the things that three gun nation has done to the sport is and, and it, I don't think it's just three gun nation. It's it was happening a lot before that, but it's pushed everybody to to tack ops, um, uh, especially you know if you're trying to uh, pay for your trip off the prize table. At a lot of matches, your only the only option you have then is to shoot tack ops. Right. Um, but yeah. I enjoy shooting open or heavy probably more than I enjoy shooting tack ops. Okay, so what do you shoot more uh, more often then? I shoot tech ops more often. Oh, uh, okay, just because of the the uh, prize table thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, heavy seems like a really fun, albeit expensive, <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, division. But uh, it's, it, it's un- fun. It's unfortunate that it doesn't get like the uh, the play it deserves because uh, you know I, I don't know. Do you, what do you think that is, Kurt? Do you think it's because it's most exp- more expensive to shoot? Like yeah, rifle and stuff? I think it's more expensive to shoot. I, I mean, you know, shooting a three hundred eight rifle, and I, of course, I prefer shooting uh, what some of the uh, purists would call watered down heavy. Um, <laughs> I like shooting heavy with a three hundred eight rifle, a nine millimeter pistol, and a semi-auto shotgun. Um, 
but I love shoot because I love shooting my 308 rifle. Right. Um, Adams Arms came out with a new 308 rifle last year, and it's just so much fun to shoot. Um, that uh, the the combination of that Adams Arms 308 and the U.S. Optic Scope on top of it, you know, uh, what more could a guy ask for? Yeah, probably makes for a pretty sweet, <laughs> sweet setup there. Yeah. So then, basically, it's just the uh, the cost then is what's keeping that division from growing. <laughs> I, I think so, um, but I also think, once again, I think it's just the same thing as keeping all the other divisions from growing. None of the divisions are really growing but TAC Ops, um, uh, and that's just because that's where the prizes are. Yeah, and that's where, like, the uh, largest amount of people are, too. So, right. like, uh, when we were at SHOT, Kalani Laker called it uh, Swimming with the Sharks, you know? Yep, so, absolutely. So, if you want to... But it's amazing, because... So, you know, you look at that, but if say if you when you go out to Superstition Mountain, um, you'll see at Superstition. If you go to Superstition Mountain, you'll see that there are a ton of top guys who say, "Screw it, I'm going to have fun and shoot open there." Um, you know, you look at guys like Travis Gibson shoot open more often than not these days. Just you know, yeah. it, it, and I'm I've started shooting more divisional stuff. Um, part of the reason I shot Tac Ops so much last year is that my uh, the pistol that Aaron built me last year was just too much fun not to shoot. Um, <laughs> well, that makes sense. So the uh, that's why I didn't shoot any open last at all last year because uh, uh, I had I got a new uh, six inch uh, Hayes custom gun from Aaron last year, um, <clears throat> uh, six inch spiral fluted uh, bull barrel nine millimeter, and that gun is just so much fun to shoot. Um, so I ended up leaving my X-Rail in the uh, safe and not throwing a second in a second optic on my rifle and just shooting TAC Ops all season. Sweet. Um, so is that going to change up this year? Uh, you know, I got a new I got a new gun coming. I got a new pistol coming. Um, I, I got I got smart this year. My new the the pistol that I've got coming from from Aaron this year is going to be. Uh, dual purpose. It's going to have two top ends. Uh, one oh. of them is going to be a six inch, just regular iron sided side tracker. Um, but then the other one is going to be for shooting open. And it's going to be a six inch, uh, hybrid barrel. So, uh, one of the things I've found over the years is I don't think a comp really helps you in three gun. Um, so I'm going to not have it to be no comp. It's just going to be three, uh, some three barrel ports on the, on the uh, Island on the hybrid barrel. Uh, and then a slide ride optic for shooting open three gun. Gotcha. Uh, cause I just love the way a six, I, I, there's just something about, uh, how a six inch shoots that I just really love the, uh, I don't know. It's just something about it. Um, even, you know, cause with a, with an iron sights gun, it's easy to, to say why, why you love a six inch gun. Cause that extra inch of sight radius on small on little steel at you know long ways out makes a world of difference oh for sure um but it also just i I don't know it also just feels better for me to me um you know we load the the ammo we load for it is so light that it basically we uh load it as light as we can get as long as light as we can go and still uh reliably run the gun right yeah no power factor in three guns so you can get pretty light on it yeah you know that extra sight radius certainly does matter like i mean it's kind of apples and oranges but when uh when i swap from shooting a glock 17 that i shot for like four years to like a glock 34 oh yeah or a 17 l oh yeah it's like holy crap this is cheating yeah i mean the the sight radius changed regardless of the what platform you're shooting that sight radius change will make will make a huge difference um that's just the that's where it, it gets down to it doesn't matter what you're shooting. The fundamentals will stay the same. Um, That's a good point. You know. So, th- so then you, uh, you're you going to be shooting open more. You mentioned uh, X-Rail. What's, uh, what's your X-Rail mounted on? So I've got a – it's the it's a Benelli M2. Um, okay. It's one of the integrated X-Rails. Um, and then I actually run a three-round three round extension on the main tube, so I get 10 rounds in the main tube and uh, – uh, three six round auxiliary tubes. So when I get to start fully loaded with one in the chamber and one ghost loaded, I, I start with thirty in the gun. <laughs> That's awesome. Just 
Because <laughs> the XRL didn't hold enough already at a, a, a plus three on it. That's so funny. It, you know, but the, there's a reason for that. Um, you know, a lot of shotgun matches, you they'll do empty gun starts. And the standard main tube on the X-Rail only holds seven rounds, so you can't put two full four-round speed loaders in it. Oh, I got you. So, thus the uh, extension. Gotcha. So, uh, integrated uh, Benelli M2 X-Rail. Yep. And uh, so when you when you do have to load or when you do those you know unloaded starts, it's probably very infrequent, but do you yeah. do, you do like a, a quad load then? Uh, no, be, uh, I've been trying to play with doing quad loading with it, be, but you can't really, because the X-Rail has so much extra weight on the, uh, the, the receiver, you can't really cut into the receiver at all. So I just use, uh, I end up using speed loaders. Oh, okay. Like, uh, like sticks type thing. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Exactly. Well, sweet. So it sounds like we, uh, we got the, uh, the gear squared away. You've got a bunch of matches, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, now I will say, when I'm not shooting open, I shoot a I shoot a Browning A5. Oh, okay. Uh, instead of a instead of a Benelli, um, because I like being able to uh, plan to run dry. Uh, uh, you know, I like to, to 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 not it not be a big deal if I run dry. I don't have to worry about a match saver. I don't have to worry about port loading. If I run dot dry, flip it over and start loading. It automatically chambers around for me, and I go. And so, for uh, if someone's listening and they're they're new to the game, it's the uh, what do they call it the auto load feature on the the Browning yep. loads the first round that you put into it. Is that right? Well, or the second round, if or the second if round you're, if you're loading twins or quad loading. Mm-hmm. That's pretty slick. So you actually uh, then plan to run dry, just run everything out of the gun, and then go go for it. I I mean, it depends on the stage. Okay. It's just that's you know it's nice to have that as another uh, tool in your toolbox. Um, if it fits in the stage where you know if I start if I start my first shotgun shooting position has nine rounds, I don't have to worry about t- you know topping off the gun. I don't have to worry about it. I just get up there, shoot my nine rounds, run the gu- run the gun dry, and as I move into the next shooting position, load it. Nice. And when I get to the next shooting position, there's a round in the chamber. It's ready to go. Now, how long have you been uh, running the A5 then? Uh, so I ran it for about a. I've run. I run the one I have now for about a season and a half. I've got about ten thousand rounds through it. Um, uh, I, you, we were a couple years ago. We were in. We went to the U.S. Carbine Association national match as a team, the Adams Arms guys, and TK had one. Um, and we started playing with TKs, and he showed us the auto load feature, and I was like, dude mind blown and yeah. i had to come home and buy one and been shooting it ever since yeah it, it seems like we're gonna i mean we have seen like pretty decent explosion of that over like the last year and I, i'm betting that we're gonna be seeing more and more because that auto load feature is ridiculous like you don't have a bunch of extra buttons and levers to exactly press and, don't have to worry about a i don't have an oversized uh bolt release on my gun don't need it do you know didn't have to do a lot of work to my gun. All really, all I needed to do, uh, all I needed to do, I've got a, another one on the way. It's, you know, this one's got a lot of rounds through it, so I've got another one on the way. And all I'll do is open up the port, throw a uh, Briley oversized charging handle in it, and, and and it's ready to go. That's awesome. Now, um, do you find that it it points better, same, just different than the Benelium too? <laughs> Uh, I I think it points a little, it points a little better for me just because I love I, if you, if you ever really looked at one closely and seen kind of it's a, how it's a the humpback design yeah you know I've got a fat face so that hump, humpback design <laughs> is perfect for me um and then uh, I guess the other thing that we had to do to it is uh, you know replace the sights uh, the one I have now has a excess rear sight and an excess front sight the new one will probably end have a uh, excess rear sight and a high vis front sight. Gotcha. And then uh, throw a longer tube on there, and you're good to go. Yep. Exactly. Sweet. Well, Kurt, when I see you on the range, I'm gonna have to try it out, man. 
Absolutely. You're welcome <laughs> to. You know, the other, the other great thing about this sport and about this community is that if anybody – you know, wants to try something out, or we have we have folks that will show up. We had a uh, one girl that showed up for our three gun match this month without a shotgun, and uh, next thing you know, she was shooting one of the guys, one of the guys in her squad's been LEM too. Yeah, that's um, that's so cool. You know, I actually ran into uh, an issue where I showed up to a match with uh, no shotgun ammo. <laughs> yep. And, uh, you know, I got bailed out by a couple of guys like, oh, I've got some extra, I've got some extra, you know, stuff like that. So it's, yep. uh, it's, it's a great community to be a part of, you know, and you don't want to do that all the time, but, oh, no. but when you make that mistake, yeah, someone yep. will definitely help you out. Yep. Well, Kurt, this is, uh, you know, this has been a lot of fun, man. A uh, couple, uh, couple last questions, uh, for you before we, uh, we'll let you go here. One, I'm going to bring this one back. A lot of people have been asking me for it, and uh, you seem like a good sport when I met you, so you might like this one. Can you tell me about your most spectacular disqualification? Uh, absolutely. Um, and it's going to go back to actually my pistol days. A um, uh, lot of pistol matches, they have uh, a lot of themed stuff. Um, and then one of the reasons you'll never see me running a race holster in three gun is so I was on a stage, I was at the, uh, I think it was 2009. I bet it was 2009, uh, uh, double tap championship up in Wichita Falls, Texas. And I loaded and make ready and the stage you had to run up there. It was the, 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 the theme of the match was, uh, uh, the, uh, Flintstones. And you had to run up there with this saber tooth tiger, open up the door, and uh, throw the uh, saber tooth tiger through, and then start shooting. Nice. So, put my gun in my ghost holster, and they hand me the gun, hand me the saber tooth tiger. And I'm standing there. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And the buzzer goes off, and I go running. And uh, as I as I'm approaching the door, I'm like, oh no did I lock my holster? Oh, um, yeah. Because with a ghost holster, you have to lock it, uh, unless you're going to be drawing it right away. So uh, uh, if, uh, if we got guys that are just, you know, getting into this, they've never seen a ghost holster because we don't use much of those, in, many of those in 3-Gun. Right. Can you describe that? So basically a ghost holster, there's not much to it. It The uh, trigger guard of your gun get, sits in it, and that's the entire holster. It covers up the trigger guard of your gun, and it's got a little ball bearing mount in there that that is all the retention it has so when you lock it that ball bearing is locked you can't it it's not going anywhere when it's not locked that that ball bearing is on a little spring and it just pop, it'll pop right out um so as i as i approached the door and i reached out as i slowed down i felt my hip get lighter oh no and i realized that nope i guess i didn't lock my ghost holder, <laughs> holster oh, man. Uh, and then to add insult to injury it was the second day of the match. The first day it had snowed on us. Um, second day was beautiful, and I didn't get to go home because I was shooting a class the next day. Oh, man. So I just had to hang out. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, so lessons that you can take away from that one, if you're ever using Super Race Holster, make sure you lock it. Yeah, absolutely. I think the lesson is, is especially in three gunners, don't use one. I've right. seen more people DQ'd because of the because of a race holster and three gun. There's still a lot of guys that open that run them though. Um, uh, I guess as long as you're you're comfortable, as long as you practice with it, um, uh, I, I I I won't do it. All right, on well, Kurt, where do you uh, where do you see the sport of three gun headed? You know, it's, it, I imagine it's going to keep getting bigger. Um, you know, we're, we're really blessed in this sport more than any other to have the industry support we have. Um, but we're also going to have to understand as the industry ebbs and flows, so will the support prize tables aren't always going to be, you're not always going to go to a match and see a hundred and fifty, hundred and eighty thousand dollars on the prize table. Right. Um, but I think it'll keep growing. Um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if, if it gets back to where you're, you're shooting more because you love to shoot than, you know, the guys that are shooting all the time because, uh, just for the prize table. Um, cause there is a lot of that and it's okay. I mean, 
people shoot as long as they're shooting. I don't care why they're shooting. Yeah. Um, you know, to each their own, right? Exactly. I, 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 and that's one of the reasons why I shoot a lot of divisional stuff. I mean, I, I, I love to pay for, I love to be able to try to pay for my, my trip off the prize table. Um, so, so I do shoot, uh, a lot of tech ops, but you know what? Sometimes I just want to have fun or sometimes I got to show off. I want to show off the new gun. That's why I shot a lot of heavy last year. They're, the prize tables and heavy are pretty, pretty sad. Um, but you know, Adam's arms, we had a great new product. Um, and I want to show it off. Uh, you know, um, yeah. And that's, uh, and more guys shooting those, those divisions means better prizes, you know? So it's, yeah, kind of a chicken or the egg type situation exactly that's that's why one of the things and you know this is you know i i i'm blessed i'm lucky to have a great group of guys working with me on the on the major match um you know aaron and brian are uh great partners in that and then you know we have a bunch of people that help us out but one of the things that i really drive in that match is uh that you don't have to shoot tech ops to 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 have fun or and you don't have to shoot tech ops to do well on the prize table either um like this year at the match every division regardless of how many people are signed up in it that we recognize which is uh, heavy optics uh open limited tech ops and then we have a ladies division ladies tech ops um every division is gonna have a thousand dollar check for whoever wins the division Five hundred dollar check for whoever gets second in the division, in addition to getting to walk a, walk a pretty stellar prize table. Wow! So. Dang man, that's pretty sweet. So, well, uh, it, uh, I I I, I, I kind of put my money where my mouth is when I say shoot the division you want to shoot, not the division you feel you need to shoot. Yeah, I'll say, geez, that's that's uh, you know definitely evidence of it right there. Yep. Well, uh, Kurt. If you uh, if you could leave the audience with just one thought or one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, I'm gonna. I've been pretty good this whole this whole time. I'm a, my one piece of advice is don't shoot guns that poop where they eat. Okay. Okay. Can you explain that? So I'm a big piston. Uh, uh, yeah, shooting for Adams Arms. Oh, I was an Adams oh, okay. Arms customer for a lot of years before I before I shot for him. And I shoot at pretty much all piston guns when it comes to ARs. I don't like to direct and pinch to ARs. Um, <laughs> I totally so. missed that. I would. <laughs> so, it's just uh, the mechanics of the gun, my man. You know, with a piston gun, all that crap gets blown out the front of the gun with a direct and pinch gun. You're pushing it back into the moving parts on purpose, and I don't understand. I don't really understand that. <laughs> all right, then. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll create some. Uh some controversy and maybe a little uh, conversation when the uh, when the show comes out. Right. Kurt, this has been a lot of fun, man. I I uh I'm glad we connected and uh, I really appreciate our talk here and thanks for being yeah. on the Three Gun show. Absolutely, thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Kurt Gruber. I really like how uh Kurt had to get smart about his practice uh when he went from uh being a swinging single guy to uh to a family man. I think that's uh I think that's pretty cool and probably helped him focus a lot, too. Now, like I said earlier, uh, we're doing a giveaway of an MGM Target uh, for the month of March. Uh, MGM has offered to give away one of their 10-inch Sportsman's Targets to uh, one lucky listener of the 3-Gun Show. Uh, for details and how to enter, just go to 3gunshow.com slash MGM and uh, enter your information there. Now, if you want to get that MGM auto popper that Kurt mentioned for his uh, practice, there's a link in the show notes at 3gunshow.com slash episode 63. And be sure to use a coupon code DHMGM10 to save 10%. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'll catch you in the next episode. Unload show clear.